When it comes to getting a functional and beautiful layout, your kitchen is the most important room to get right and the most likely room you'll get wrong. And given the importance of having the heart of the home be a functional, usable, warm, inviting, and overall friendly space to be enjoyed and worked really hard by you, your family, and friends, it's essential that you make the right layout choices from the start. But don't worry, I've got you covered with this layout that I honestly think will earn the badge of greatest of all time. It's usable, it's sexy, it allows for multiple cooks, it has all the storage and fits into almost any home footprint. Check it out and see why it easily earns the GOAT award. If you're struggling to find a kitchen layout that actually works for your home, or you didn't even know you had a layout problem, but you just always feel frustrated in your kitchen when you're trying to cook, then this video is for you. Today I'm gonna to share the kitchen layout that I affectionately call the greatest of all time because it ticks all the boxes. This kitchen has the triangle, it has the storage, it has beauty, it has natural light, it has protection, it has guest seating, and it has all the other little details that most people don't think about, all built in. It can be scaled up or down according to your requirements and space, and it can have added components like a walk-in pantry or extra cabinets as needed. And today I'm gonna to show all of this to you, explain why it rocks, and even give you the drawings and models so that you can implement this in your own renovation or new build plans. Here's what I'm sharing today. In this video, I'll walk you through the layout and explain individual design decisions and the reasons why they all work so well. I'm gonna share why something is where it is instead of somewhere else, which really is critical to truly seeing the value in this layout. Most people don't give nearly enough thought to their floor plan and end up with something frustrating. So understanding the why behind each choice is really a must. This is how you can implement the same strategies in your own home even if your space won't allow this exact layout. So why am I sharing this? If you're new to me and what I do here, Barn Cat Renovations helps homeowners who want to renovate or build new homes do their own planning instead of paying thousands for these services and still being disappointed in the end because the planning is really something that homeowners can and should be doing themselves. Part of that planning is creating your 2D and 3D plans just like what I'm about to share. Part of that planning is creating your own 2D and 3D plans, just like what I'm about to share. So I have a three-part program called SketchUp for Homeowners, where I teach you how to create your own layouts and 3D models, just like this one for your own home. So if you're interested in learning this program, which is actually quite simple and intuitive, then I'll add some links to the video description and in the page on my website. And then you can download the actual plans. If you're watching this video on my website, then just scroll down and there's a sign up form directly below this video. If you're on YouTube, go to barncatreno.com forward slash 24 and you'll see this video and the form underneath. Toss in your info and I'll email you a zip file with two documents. The first is a PDF showing you the detailed 2D layout with, with the dimensions so that you can see a clean version. The second is a SketchUp model, which includes the 2D floor plans, plural, because there is the main one plus um, a couple of other variations for additional walk-in pantry and extra storage. And the SketchUp model also has the layout done in 3D so that you can play around with it and see how it feels. Then you can literally copy and paste the components into your own model. So if you're interested in the PDF and the SketchUp model, you can grab them on my website just below the video at barncatreno.com forward slash 24. Okay, so let's dive into the juicy stuff. Without further ado, I present to you the greatest kitchen layout of all time. Here she is. I'll show you in 3D first so you can get the feel for it, and then we'll switch to 2D so that you can see the individual parts. And this file is the actual one I'll email you when you sign up. Okay, so here is the kitchen layout. One just quick note about this 3D render before we dig into the details is that I have intentionally left this one with very little styling. So the cabinets are white, they don't have any specific door styles, they're not shaker or anything, they're just flat, they don't have any handles or knobs or anything like that and I've done that specifically to just keep this as bland as possible because I don't want you to get too overwhelmed by the style of it and say well that's not my kitchen or you know I was really hoping for wood or black or whatever it is that you might want. So I've just left this plain white very standard so that you can customize as you want because I don't want you getting hung up on that. This is just for layout purposes only. So you may not want wood shelves up here. That's totally fine. It's up to you. You may not want shelves at all. This is really just um, a quick visualization of the 2D layout so that you can see the scale and the size of it. That's the first thing. The second thing is that um, 
this is a really, I did this one really quickly, just again, so that you could visualize it. So the actual construction of this model is not how I would do it if I was doing this properly, if this was my house. Um, if you join SketchUp 3D, uh, which is part of my SketchUp for Homeowners course, Trilogy course, I actually have each one of these cabinets prepared, ready to go as a pre-formed component so that you could just drag and drop them into your own model and it's basically plug and play and it makes it really, really easy to create your own 3D models if you're not super, super familiar with SketchUp um, and that's just something I've done for my 3D students. So I think that's going to be a really cool feature if you're interested in trying to take this and, and put it into your own model to use your own um, floor plans and turn them into 3D designs. That's going to be something that's hugely, hugely beneficial for you. Um, and this version that's just in the downloadable file, it's just a really quick mock-up. So that's just something to note about uh, if you join my program. As you can see, it's got a main L shape component in its uh, back walls. So that's what this shape is here, the L shape plus the island. The great thing about an L shape plus island kitchen is that you've got two entry points, one over here and one over here. So there's only two ways that people can get into this space, which is great because it means that as the main cook back here, you've got a little bit of protection. It also means that you can maximize the length of your island when the island goes this way along uh, the long edge of your L shape, which is really important because islands are great, right? We know that. And um, the reason, the main reason is because you can stand here in this area and you can prep and you can be facing outwards to all your family or guests or whoever's hanging out here with you so that they can be in the space, but they're not in your triangle, which you need to have protected. It's always better to look out versus at a wall. So when you're t talking about finding your main prep space, whenever you can keep that main prep space at an island, it's always advantageous. It's more social. Um, there's no upper cabinets or anything to get in your way, bang your head on, or be otherwise bothersome when you're standing at an island. You don't need any special under cabinet lighting to light up your countertop. You can just use whatever task lighting you plan in the space. Islands are typically also deeper than your standard against the wall cabinets, which is 24 inches back here is your standard versus an island, you know, you can go way deeper. This one here is uh, 48, but you can also, you can go a little bit deeper than that. Um, or even a little, even smaller than that, 36 is still gonna be an ample sized space for doing prep, which is fantastic. So the one thing to note about this um, layout overall is that it could be flipped on its axis. So this wall could be over here with everything going the opposite way. It could be flipped around the other side. This is just the way I'm presenting it to you, but um, you can definitely flip it if your house has a sort of the opposite configuration. One of the great things that I love about this uh, layout is that it really maximizes exterior wall space. So the bulk of the space, the longest wall is actually on the exterior wall. And what that allows you to do is maximize the amount of windows. And this is so important because, you know, we always hear that the kitchen is the heart of the home. Well, what does that mean, right? Of course, we've all heard this and I'm sure you believe it too, as I do. But you know what I keep seeing? I keep seeing all these people designing kitchens that don't adhere to this principle. Because for me, the, I would like to see a kitchen with the most amount of natural light, right? People tend to want to hang out in spaces that have the most natural light. And if you put your kitchen somewhere back in a corner where there are no windows, then it's not going to be filled with natural light and people aren't going to want to hang out there. And you'll find that it won't feel like what you imagine the heart of the home feeling like. So the great thing about this layout is that we've got huge amounts of windows and glass coming so that all that natural light can stream in here and it can um, affect not just you here doing the cooking, but also your guests here are going to feel that, which is what's amazing. So whenever you've got, say, competing priorities between a kitchen being on the exterior wall and, say, a dining room, which is what I see a lot in certain new build homes going up, um, I see a lot of people putting the dining room or the breakfast nook right in front of the windows. And yet it just doesn't make sense to me because given the choice, right, a dining room or a breakfast nook where you might spend, what, 30 minutes a few times on a weekend, you know, why would you prioritize that over the kitchen where you're spending much more time overall? 
right? Even on a rushed morning, your kids are likely to spend more time sitting at your kitchen island versus a nook over by themselves while you're doing all the cleanup and breakfast and everything that you're doing, right? It always takes longer to make the pancakes than to eat the pancakes. So if it was me, I would always put my kitchen on the exterior wall where it's going to get the most light. And so since we're talking about sun, let's kick off this um, this journey by talking about this huge window here and specifically what's underneath it. So you can see here, we've got uh, part one of the main triangle. With the sink here, the range over here, and the fridge over here, we've got our triangle, okay? So that's a really important part. A lot of people think that the triangle is not valid anymore, but it really is. This is still how people cook. People still have to take stuff out of the fridge. They have to bring it over here to prep it. And this here is going to be your main prep zone right about here. This sort of right in front of this second stool. If we look at it like this, this is kind of going to be your main prep zone, right? And then you're going to go over to the sink and do stuff with the sink and you're going to cook stuff over here, right? So this has, this is the triangle and the prep zone is the, is the thing that's sort of always missing from the triangle. But really that's what you're, that's where you're spending all your time before you use any of these other elements, right? So it really should always be right in the middle and that's what this layout provides. So under this window over here is what I would consider to be the ideal setup. Now, there's gonna be a lot of opinions about this and that's totally fine if you prefer to have two sinks or one big sink or you you know never leave your dishes to drip dry. There's, there's lots of discussion that you can have here but I'm just gonna explain what I would do if it was me. And this is a bit of a hack drawing here in this model for the 3D just to demonstrate the placement of things but this is, this is what I really like to have um, in terms of a setup. So this overall sink zone is 48 inches, which is really, really big, um, considering for most people go for just a single sink that is maybe 30 or 36 inches wide. But I really think it's important to have some sort of integrated drying area because at least for me, we always just leave our dishes to drip dry. Any of the big pots and pans that we have to wash that can't fit in the dishwasher, we just let them drip dry and then put them away once they're dry. So that's us. Um, this is a very similar drawing to um, the the one that's called the Galley brands. That's They have a wash station there with a dry dock. I haven't used it myself yet, so I cannot speak to the quality or you know I'm not an affiliate for them or whatever, but it's it's an example so you can see kind of what I'm talking about here, but what the setup would be where you've got this drying area that's actually integrated into the sink, which I think is really cool because then you don't have to have, uh, you know, a plastic or metal drying rack that sits on top or inside a sink that's just going to get dirty over time. This, you can just take this first rack off, put it in the dishwasher, and then you wipe down the stainless steel counter that, or the, um, uh, sink <laughs> that's underneath. So I think that's a really cool feature. Um, and I'm definitely going to be looking into this for uh, when we do our upcoming renovation very soon. So over here, the, so I have the drying area taking up about 18 inches, which is a good size for me, but you could shrink this, this down to 12 and that leaves th um, 30 inches, two and a half feet for the main sink, which I think is a really ample size for a big kitchen sink. Um, I don't, it doesn't need to be super deep, but if you like it deep, this is, these are sort of the questions that you're going to have. Um, to deal with. Um, now in this model, I don't have another prep sink. So this sink needs to be shared between all the activities, which is why it's in such a great spot. For this reason, you need to make sure that your faucet and your drain are in the right spots. Now your faucet can be in the middle of the 48 inch space, which is what I have shown here because I know that it's symmetrical with the window and most people would just kill me if they <laughs> didn't see this being symmetrical. Now, the important thing though, is that obviously just the sink part itself is not gonna provide that same symmetry, right? I have incorporated this drying dock as part of the 48 inches. So for me, this whole sink area is the main wash zone and that is what's symmetrical against the window and where the faucet is. And so this might bother some people, but this actually makes a lot of sense based on where the angle of this faucet's gonna be. It means when it's over here in the corner, it's actually gonna reach out to sort of this area. And that way you'll have this area kind of free, which I think is really important for rinsing. So it does make sense to keep this in the middle also because you need to be able to spray down both ends of this. If you put the faucet way over here where it's closer to this end, your, your spray faucet, even if it's on a long tube, is going to reach over here in order to clean it up which I don't love so I think that it's really great to have the, the sprayer and keep this in the middle and then you can reach both sides of your sink so in this case I like to have the sink drain sort of far over to the left if you can do that if once you talk to your plumber about what the options are but that's where I like to have it 
That way you can do your rinsing over in sort of the middle left of the sink area, washing all the dirty stuff to the left, further away from the clean drying zone. It's just going to eliminate some of the, um, the you know, the spray and the splashes of potentially oily, greasy stuff on your new. Now over here under the dry dock is your uh, garbage pullout. Now. Note, the best spot is under the drying dock, in my opinion, because this pullout should not be a full height bin. This is really critical because a lot of people make this mistake, okay? So imagine the amount of garbage that you'd need before you filled up a bin that was actually 30 inches, like a full 30 inches high, right? If you had a bin that, that was that big, how much garbage would you need? Oh, so much garbage. And guess what? Ideally, most of that should go into an organics bin or a compost bin um, or the recycling, leaving very little for the trash bin. And chances are what is left will be very stinky, like chicken trays or whatever. So you'll need to be emptying out your bin regularly so it doesn't stink up your whole house. So are you gonna be feeling very good about emptying a barely full, massive bag of garbage? Probably not. So why don't you just get a small bin that fills up really quickly because you'll need to be emptying it regularly anyway, okay? So that's my strategy on that. You can empty it daily. You're not gonna feel bad because you didn't use a massive garbage bag in to you know, fill up a massive bin. So this is why having this under here makes a lot of sense because you only need a small drawer. The great other thing about using a smaller bin is that you can fit your organics bin uh, right in behind it. So you could have your garbage at the front or your organics at the front, however um, you want to operate it, but you can have both in because they're going to be smaller bins. They can go um, widthwise in this 18 inch sized drawer and you can fit two of them in there. So you can just pull it out once and you can stand here at the sink and do all of your scraping and everything right into this pull out drawer here, which is a little bit shorter. And you can also do um, one of those really cool things. You could, you could build this yourself if your cabinet maker isn't going to include it or is going to charge you a hefty amount where it sort of acts as a, a barrier around the bins that so they'll slide right into it and you can make this out of plywood and then it prevents all the yucky bits of food from falling down around the bins it keeps your whole area clean which I think is really cool what this setup also allows for is when you're standing at the sink here sort of right in the middle of the sink area which is about where this line is here these two cabinet doors you know, you could even leave this open for the most part and it's not gonna be, you're not blocking it. So you could just be working in the sink, scraping your plates, you know, rinsing over here, putting them right in the dishwasher, which we'll get to in a second. And all of those two areas are, they can both be left open and you have ample space here with your 30 inches to stand here and go between the two items. So whoever is doing the washing up has a really good wash up triangle, right? You go from dishwasher to sink to garbage bins and that is the triangle, the wash station triangle that is set up here that works so, so well. I really like having some sort of uh, towel rack right on the front here. Uh, you don't want it to be sticking out too much because otherwise it's gonna jab into your hips when you're leaning uh, over the sink. But having it here means that it's out in the open, it can dry easily, which is really important for a hand towel or a dish towel, whatever you're using, and it's really accessible for people. If you don't like the visual look of it, then there's other places you can put it, but I really like having the utility of just having it right there. Now, of course, to the left here, we have the dishwasher. And the dishwasher is on this side, not because I'm left-handed or any other rule, but this is where the dishes, the dirty dishes pile up. So as you finish eating, as you are finished cooking and you get rid of, you know, plates, bowls, anything that you want, they're all gonna pile up here. And this is a critical thing that a lot of people miss. They, a lot of people think that the dishwasher just has to be on the, on the right side because most people are right-handed or because many people put it that way. But the problem with that is, is that you're, when you have your dirty dishes over here to pile up to your dishwasher that's underneath, it means that you're putting your clean dishes over here. And the problem with that is that when you're bringing over, you know, dripping pans or, you know, you've got a pot of water that you need to uh, drain because you've been cooking pasta and you're bringing it over this way, all of that drippings, all of that stuff is going to drip over your clean dishes in order to get to the sink, which we do not want, right? You want your clean dishes as far away from your cooking and your prep zone as possible so that they dry in a clean area. So that's why this area over top of the dishwasher makes sense for piling up dirty dishes. So some of them will go in the dishwasher for, um, for cleaning that way and some of them will continue this way to be washed in the sink and then they'll end up over here. Having the dishwasher here means that it's also closer for putting your dishes away, which um, we'll get to over here, and it just makes a lot of sense. So this is why the dishwasher is here, right next to the sink. It's a great spot, and this is going to be your dirty dish zone. So now let's move along 
to our cooking zone here. Now, I've just used a very standard, the 30 inch wide range with the oven below. This is something that you can get at, you know, any big box store or an appliance store. It's very standard, which to be honest, I really like. I'm a big fan of standard appliances because they're gonna break. They're absolutely gonna break one day and it's so much easier to replace a standard sized appliance than it is a very custom one with custom panels. Like I, I you know, I get that the paneled appliances look beautiful, but man, functionally, I just think that um, replaceable ones make a lot more sense. But you know, um, at least sticking with the standard sizes, even if they are panel ready, makes a lot of sense for you moving forward in the future, like looking at your future self. And what I have on either side here, which can be shortened a little bit if you need to, is 18 inches of extra wall space. And the reason is because you need, you need these drop zones on either side, which are drop zones for things like when you need to put down your spatula when you're cooking and, or you need to, you've got, you know, milk that you're heating in a jug that you use to pour in very slowly for your bechamel sauce, whatever that is, this is where you need this space. You absolutely cannot get away with less than 12 inches on either side. That's actually the code here. And you, you need some space. So 18 inches should be ample here so that you can stand here. You could even have a couple of chefs. You could still have enough space for somebody to be loading the dishwasher right next to you. And you're not going to get in each other's way, which is really critical. If you do want to put a bigger range in here, you absolutely can. Um, you would just keep extending this a little bit, um, or you could either, either shorten um, these wall flanking sides from 18 inches down to 12. If you've got a bigger range and you don't need as much space, that's totally fine as well. I feel like this amount of space, given the 30 inches, looks really balanced. So I really like the look of that as well as the functionality. Now in this drawing, I just put in some open shelves here, but you can do, oh, we're zoomed right in, uh, but you can really do whatever you want here. If you want two shelves, if you want no shelves, you want one of those cute little, you know, English country kitchen shelves, those little thin ones made out of your, your backsplash slab, um, whatever it is, that's totally fine. This is totally up to your preference what you put here. Um, I would not recommend cabinets, full cabinets, because um, they're just gonna feel really bulky and sort of out of place with this very open concept look and feel. Um, but you can put whatever shelving you want. Just remember that whatever you do put here, even if that's you know your rail where you put hang your cast iron pants, whatever your preference is, everything in this area is gonna get covered in dust and grease. So, you know, don't overdo it. Don't overdo the stuff that you're putting here, you know, but so that's why maybe only two shelves is a little bit better. Um, the key is that you, you don't wanna overdo it because everything will get dirty and greasy and sticky. So it's just gonna require a lot more cleaning no matter what you put here. Just know that up front. Uh, but I do like to have a few things here when I'm cooking. I like to keep all our, you know, wooden spoons and stuff right out on the counter. We just have one little container of it. It doesn't feel overwhelming or look cluttered. I also like to have my salt and pepper, olive oil, coconut oil, whatever you like to have. Um, just a few choice things that you use all the time. I really like to, to display that here. Maybe a plant that's easy to wipe down from all the grease stains too. Um, that's up to your choosing. But anyway, but this is the, the cook zone and I think it's really functional given the sizing. Having the range and the exhaust hood on the exterior wall is critical and that's why it's placed here. This way you can directly vent the exhaust right outside. It doesn't have to go up. It doesn't have to go around any corners. It can be vented directly outside and you can also have your little air intake here as well. If you have the space, I like to suggest an extra 12, maybe 18 inches at most, um, inches on this side for an extra window here before this bank of cabinets, which we'll get to in a second. Having this extra window here, even if it's narrow, even if it's only 12 inches, is gonna be really, really nice if you can, if you have the space, because it's gonna help frame the cooking area, which I know everybody loves. They love their symmetry, and this will, even though it doesn't totally match in terms of the symmetry of this window small, this one is big, that doesn't matter. This is still going to help frame the, the, the cooking area and give this area the symmetry that I know you're gonna love. Um, and it also gives a lot more light and extra ventilation to this otherwise sort of dark corner, right? If you didn't have this extra window here, this whole area would be just a little bit darker. And yes, artificial light will help this, but um, if you have the space for the window, I really recommend it. So let's just review this. You can see here that there are no upper ca cabinets. We've talked about that, how you can have a couple of shelves here, but it really doesn't have any upper cabinets, which creates such an open and airy feel here, right? If you're in this kitchen, you're in this space, it really feels nice and big and open. 
Now, I really like having um, countertops that go all the way into the edge of the window and having the window come all the way down like this because it does give extra space back here, which is really great for your faucet. It makes it all feel much more roomy, um, but it is more expensive because you've got to get more countertop and um, stone is definitely going to not be your cheapest item in, in, the, um, in your budget but I really like the look of it. Now, if this is not your preferred look, you can obviously have your wall come up to a certain point um, and then have your window start above that. That's all down to your preference, but this is my, this is the look that I really like and having a, a windows as big as I can possibly have them um, to let in all that beautiful natural light. Now, again, I really don't think that you need upper cabinets anywhere on this wall just based on what you have here. Right, so we, when you're washing dishes, I don't know what you would really need to reach for, because anytime you lift your arm up, you're just gonna have water dripping down your, your arm and your sleeve, which isn't great. And you know, you've got a few things here for whatever you might need to reach for for the stovetop. But other than that, you, you know, I think it's pretty solid that you don't need any upper cabinets here. I don't think you're you're missing out by not having upper cabinets and by maximizing the window length. Now, regarding the dimensions, I do have a seven foot window here, which is huge. Um, I like to see, now it's not specifically drawn here right now, these are even, but I do like to see either um, like a three or four foot um, awning style window over the sink so that you have this big, nice uninterrupted view, or you can go with it like this and make this middle whole section an awning. Either way, I this is what I recommend is putting this middle section be an awning. And the reason for that is because it'll allow you to open it in the rain and still get some nice airflow, which is great uh, as you're doing some washing up. On the flanks, um, if these are, these can either be, again, equal sized or they can be smaller. Um, I wouldn't go any smaller than 18 inches so that they line up with the edges of the sink, which, you know, might be more appealing for some of you versus the three sections of um, equal size. This is totally up to you. Either way, I would do these two flanking sections of the window as casements. Casements are much better for airflow, but they probably shouldn't be left open in the rain. And same with this one over here, I would make this a casement as well so that you can open it just a crack and get ventilation on this side. Um, but it does, it, that's going to give you the best airflow. Now we'll look briefly at the lower cabinets over here. So you can see, um, on the far right here, these are just some standard drawers based on whatever you want here. Um, I, I think this space is primarily for sort of odds and ends as well as things like dish towels, grocery lists, paper, measuring tape, whatever you sort of have in your junk drawers. This is the space for that. Now I like this to be a minimum of 18 inches. If you have the space that way, it's nice and symmetrical over here with the window, right? Because you've got 18 inches on this side and then 18 inches on this side. It's lovely. But if you don't have the space for this, it's okay. You can shrink your window. You can shrink some space here and there. Um, to make this smaller. And if you don't have room for it at all, that is also okay. You can still work with that. If you do have the space, that's a nice size. So um, 18 to 24 inches is always good. And if you do make it bigger, if you do have more space for cabinetry, your window can still end at 18 inches and your cabinets can go beyond that. Moving left, we talked about having our organics pull out here. And of course this piece here, because this might be a recessed part of the sink, this could be a, a solid panel that doesn't open. It's just visually there. This is gonna be your 30 inch uh, sink opening. Now I recommend keeping these as cabinet doors because uh, if you ever have a plumbing issue and you need to fix the pipes back in there, then this is gonna give you the easiest access. If you have, if you make these as drawers, you absolutely can, but then you have to remove the drawers in order to have space to put your body in this area to fix the plumbing. So that's just a, <laughs> it's totally doable, but you know, it might just be easier to keep these as cabinet doors. It's, I think it's the only cabinet doors um, on the lower cabinets that we have in the entire kitchen. So it's a, it's a good spot to have your, your one token cabinet. We talked about the dishwasher. That's a standard 24 inch one. Now over here is where I really like to have uh, a little paper towel dispenser, which I think is a really cool feature because it keeps the paper towel off of the wall or the countertop. And so it keeps the visual clutter away, which is important. And then it's right here. It's accessible for your stovetop cooking. It's accessible for the sink. If you need it, it's accessible for when you're doing your prep here, it's sort of right in the middle of everything. And really, really in a good spot. So I like that. Below that, I like to have um, a, this sort of skinny pullout drawer. Now this is 12 inches because I've got my 24 inch dishwasher and uh, another 12 inches here makes up the 36 inches, the three feet, which matches up nicely with the 18 inches here and then the 18 inches of window, right? So everything's kind of matching up and symmetrical, even though this is only 12 and this is 24. You're not gonna notice that that's not, you know, lining up with the end of this wall, right? This makes sense. 
So this is where I would put um, any pans, cookie sheets, that type of thing that you use all the time. And we've got our 30 inch stove. And then over here, we've got uh, another set of drawers. Now, if you don't have space for this window here, then you won't be able to have a huge bank of drawers here. But if you do manage to have a full 18 inches here, even a 12, whatever that ends up being over here in this corner, you can still have a nice set of drawers here and put some pots and pans, which I think is really important. Now, the most the most important thing out of this whole area to, to zoom in on here is this space here, right? You need two to three inches on both sides of this corner so that your drawers can open because I haven't included drawer pulls on these drawers visually just because I don't want to get into the aesthetics in this particular model. But you would, most people have some sort of drawer pull which is going to stick out two or three inches, maybe even more. So that's one of the things you really need to pay attention to is how much space are you leaving here and how big are your drawer pulls and how much are they sticking out because you need to be able to open this drawer without it getting stuck on this drawer pull. Otherwise, your functionality of this corner is going to go bye-bye. So you have to leave some space in there for that corner. What does that mean up here? It means this is 18 inches and instead of this being, say this is, um, I think this is a 30 inch cabinet right here. So it means your window will either be 12 inches and then you'll have a little space or it can actually go a little bit longer and take up the extra width there. Um, so this might be actually a 15 inch window, whatever it is to match it up um, with the space that's available, which is a really cool little feature. Now let's switch views and look at this bank of cabinets over here, okay? Because this is, uh, this is the next piece. So this, as you'll notice, is a full 24 inch deep, full height, whatever your kitchen height is. I think I've only accounted for eight feet in this, in this drawing, but um, if you have taller ceilings, you can definitely stretch these up taller. It's totally up to you. Um, but the important thing here is that this is a full depth, um, full wall of cabinets. And I think this is really important because it makes a great spot for your fridge to go and everything, the depth of it will disappear in your mind because you won't feel like it's a full bank of cabinets. You won't feel like anything is sticking out awkwardly because it's all surrounded um, at the same depth, which I think is really important. So let's talk about this corner unit first. What I have down here is sort of, um, it's hard to um, show you how it would be pulled out, but this is one of those sort of garage door openers that either goes up over this cabinet or somehow gets tucked in the sides, whatever it is so that you can have access to what's inside. And what I wanna see here is a pull out shelf. And this is where you can store some of your most used um, appliances, things like your toaster. Maybe if you use a blender every day, um, if you use a toaster oven, whatever whatever you can put here uh, that's going to be stuff that you want to use all the time, your kettle, stuff that you use every day but that you don't necessarily want to leave out at all, all times. You want to be able to tuck it away somewhere. Now the other important thing about this, um, which is different from a lot of people who would typically have countertop going around the corner with just your standard upper cabinets, right? That's what most people do and the, you know, and just have their kettle sitting out. The problem with that is that any uh, little small appliance that heats up, so your toaster, your kettle, you cannot keep, you cannot use when they're underneath a traditional upper cabinet because it's going to void your warranty. And a lot of people don't know that or think about it, but anytime you've got heat and steam going up into the bottom of a cabinet, it's going to affect the construction of it. So you can't do that. So the great thing about having this little pullout drawer is that it can come out. It can, you can use your appliances, let them cool. As soon as all the heat's gone, you just tuck them back in there and they're out of the way, which is great. Obviously this cabinet here, apart from the very first shelf is going to be be really inaccessible for most people you want to use this cabinet sparingly for things that you know anything on the bottom shelf you can use obviously but anything up top maybe you'd want to use your your Christmas gravy boat or your Thanksgiving candle something that you really don't need to access too often you can keep at the top of this cabinet coming around the corner this whole cabinet here is what I like to dedicate to the tableware so cutlery would always go in this bottom or sorry this top drawer here just directly underneath um, the countertop level because that's where everybody expects it and it makes the most sense. Below that you could use this drawer for plates, cups, bowls, whatever you want. It's really common nowadays to find uh, major tableware items in a drawer which is really important because traditionally we only think of those things in upper cabinets but poor kids can't reach that stuff up here so making that accessible down here for some of your main plates and bowls is a really great solution 
And then under here, if you want to use that for more stuff or you want to put a mesh front on this and store your potatoes and your onions under there, that's cool. You could use it for Tupperware, that sort of thing, whatever you like. Um, in this upper cabinet area, that's where I like to put anything else that you have. Maybe it's, you know, water glasses that you don't want the kids to be able to reach so easily. Um, you can put whatever you want in there. Now, one option I have here, I have this shown as an opening, um, but you don't have to have it. Um, open like this. I know, again, I'm mentioning the symmetry because I know you all love symmetry in your spaces. So having this open creates a symmetrical look over here with the microwave, which I'll talk about in a second, uh, but you don't need to have it open. This could very easily be closed and just continue to be more, um, more drawers or I guess cabinets at this point um, that you can open up and access. Uh, but if you do want to put some, you know, a fruit bowl or anything else here, I think that's a really good spot for it. Again, because it keeps it out of the way. It's not cluttering up the rest of your countertops, which are your more usable stations um, and can be a quite a nice little nook and break up the look of all these cabinets. And of course, to the left of that is our fridge. It is critically important here that you get a counter depth fridge. I like a 36 inch wide one because that's really gonna maximize the space and um, and allow you to access everything that's in the back of the fridge. If you get a standard depth fridge, you are going to have food rotting at the back. I think it's inevitable because you just can't reach the stuff back there. You don't see it, it just disappears in that back shelf and you know, and stuff goes bad. So having um, a 36 inch wide counter depth fridge, I find really gives you much more usable space than uh, your standard depth fridge. So I, this is what I would always recommend. And of course it's gonna stick out a little bit because you have handles and, um, and the actual door, but it's counter depth is still gonna give you this nice streamlined look and it's not gonna feel like it's jutting out too much. So that's, that's definitely what to do. And then you can, um, it, what it also does, it keeps your upper cabinets all in line here. So the ones that go on top of the fridge can be totally flush with the other standard depth cabinets, which is really nice because if you have a, st a standard depth fridge sticking out here an extra six inches, then what do you do with this cabinet? It's just gonna, do you, do you stick it out with the fridge and then it won't line up with these cabinets? That's not a good idea. So this is, this is what I recommend. And then to the left of the fridge, you've got another bank of cabinets here, which I like to use for your pantry, especially if you don't have space for any additional pantry area, which we will talk about in a second, then this is gonna be your main pantry spot. And then the microwave here, this is critical because most people, or at least, you know what, I shouldn't say most people, I use the microwave most for defrosting breads, muffins, soups, whatever I've made and then frozen. Um, and keep in the freezer here. This is the this is direct access to to defrost in order to feed the kids. I know a lot of people like to pretend that they don't microwave stuff these days, and they like to just hide it in the back of their you know walk-in pantry and stuff. But you know if you do keep a lot of uh, food in your freezer that you need to defrost daily, then having it close to your freezer is a really important idea. So that's where I like to keep that. Okay, so that is the bank of wall-to-wall -wall cabinets. I love this and I think it's incredibly functional. And with it all being 24 inches deep, you can actually store way more than you could just in this one cabinet than you could even if this entire wall was covered in just shallow upper cabinets. If you do the math, you'll see that the actual um, internal volume of this cabinet is is greater than if you had this entire wall covered in your just your standard 12 inch deep upper cabinets okay and so this allows you to have enough storage for all the things you need in your kitchen without needing uppers back here which i think is amazing okay so let's switch our attention to the island first of all um i like to plan 42 inches of walkway space in between the two zones here and actually i'm going to switch over to my 2D plan, let's go down here, go down here, and so you can see it this way. So here's the, the plan view, of course. You can see everything um, here. We've got the little dotted lines meaning that there's cabinets under there just to show the division. So I like to leave 42 inches as a minimum here for walkways, three and a half feet. Um, if you wanna do more, you can, you can do 48. If you've got a lot of people cooking in your kitchen at the same time, if that's how you operate, then having four feet might feel like it's a little bit more spacious. You could even go four and a half feet, though I don't typically recommend going more than that because um, you sort of lose the connection between your appliances and the, the prep zone here if it's too far away, it feels, um, a little bit, I don't know, it feels a little bit far to take stuff five feet across here to, to the stove and to the sink, but 
uh, that's up to you, especially if you have a huge space, then maybe that makes more sense. But in a smaller kitchen, I really don't think you need to lose island footage, um, square footage just for walkway. So three and a half feet is what I have here, which I think is ample. You can definitely open your appliances and still edge past. Same with your dishwasher, you can have that open and you can still edge past. Now the dimensions of this particular island are nine and a half feet. You could do this as a smaller island. If, you, if you've got something over here that requires a walkway or furniture that's coming up to here, you can definitely do this smaller. Um, I've done nine and a half feet because that is the absolute maximum that I like to see on an island and here is why. Most stone slabs, if you're using stone, which most people do these days, if you're using stone, uh, most slabs are a maximum of 10 feet long. And once you take off, you know, a little bit for any chips or dents, then you're, you really don't want to account for any more than nine and a half feet. Otherwise, you're going to need two pieces and you're going to have a seam, right? And that's just always risky. Do they, are they exact matches? Do they look good together? Where's the seam? Have they done a good job with the seam? seam um so you know if you are only thinking about well maybe another six inches would be nice or another foot ah, i don't think it's worth it i would i would definitely err on the side of caution and try and get away with uh one slab wherever in terms of the other dimension you've got this one here is shown as 48 inches so four feet um, and that allows you to have one solid bank of your standard depth cabinets over here it also allows you to have a second batch here of really narrow cabinets that are just gonna go right here um, that are gonna take your full length and still only be just 12 inches deep. So you've still got 12 inches of overhang for people to sit and get scooched their little stools under. Now, if you don't have the space this way for a, um, an island that big, then just going to 36 inches and not having that extra bank of cabinets under here facing the other way is absolutely fine. Maybe you won't even wanna do that for budget reasons right because having the extra cabinetry there if you don't need it is totally unnecessary and that way you can actually save on your stone as well because you don't need four feet you could just get away with three feet and that is absolutely acceptable and a really great size for an island like you know it it's not doing it justice just how big a nine and a half foot island is you know for most people who come from a uh you know a relatively small kitchen with a you know not a lot of counter space going from having no island at all, where you're just sort of stuck in this corner trying to work away with upper cabinets over your head. I mean, anyone who's in a you know 70s or 80s kitchen is gonna deal with that. All of a sudden you have any island space whatsoever, let alone nine and a half or eight and a half, even five feet of island space is gonna feel dreamy, right? So you definitely don't need to go bigger than that, I, I think, for most people. Um, and having 36 inches of, of depth is gonna be amazing as well. I think I mentioned this briefly before, but your island and your back cabinet, these lengths do not have to match up. Okay, this is critical. Do not think that these have to match up for your kitchen to look normal. Nobody stands right at the corner here and says, oh, this is, you know, this is off by six inches or eight inches or 10 inches or whatever it is, a couple feet. You can extend this, you can shorten it. Um, you can do whatever you want here. They don't have to end at the same spot. Okay, what matters more is the look of this back wall with your window and the functionality that you're going to have on this back island or this back wall area uh, is so much more important than having these two things match up, right? Your island can just, it can just be wherever you want it to be. It doesn't have to be an exact 42 inches here and it also doesn't have to line up exactly with this because you could have furniture out here or this back cabinet wall could go all the way into you know your living room or your dining room and it could go all the way it doesn't have to line up okay and even if it's off by a few inches nobody's going to notice so try not to focus on that being now in terms of your the drawers in the island i'm not too fussy about what you do here this is just to, to demonstrate one idea for for drawers um, you can have them be however you want it to be. But I like I like keeping it all as drawers. I think they're the most functional. I like having three sort of um, shallower drawers at the top, your main uh, knives and prep materials. Maybe you want to have your tin foil and plastic up in one. Um, the other thing I do like to have in here is my spice uh, jars. I like to use wide mouth mason jars so that they're really easily... Um, openable and I like to have the I have these plastic lids that go on them they're really cool so I'll show you those and uh, so that's what I would put in my top drawers and then whatever else you use for your cooking down below you can make those be whatever you want and again if you have space 
for an extra bank of cabinets, you can certainly use that, but there's no pressure to use that. Now, one thing I do like here is um, to have a sort of little bookcasey type thing on the end. And the reason for that is because I like to keep my cookbooks somewhere that are is visible. You know, that's a nice little um, perk. I like to keep a box of Kleenex. I like to have hand cream because you know when you're washing dishes a lot, your hands get dry. You need some, you need some hand cream here. Um, maybe a speaker, whatever else. You know, any little trinkets that you want to have on display. But again, that you don't want to have cluttering up your countertop space. This is so important. So having a, a display area is going to give you some more freedom. Same with your fruit bowl, right? Like having these little nooks built in. You could do something over here too if you wanted. Um, having these intentional spaces, but uh, baked into your plan means that you can display the things that you want without having to have it as, as cluttery countertop stuff. So that's our main layout. I've really gone into intense detail to describe the why behind all these decisions and hopefully, you know, give you a demonstration of why this makes sense and what you're storing where and some of the thought process behind it um, to make it functional as well as, you know, quite pretty. Um, but I want to also show you a couple more options because I know this this you know is an is a is a vision that can be scaled. So in, for instance, if you don't have space for this window here, you can get rid of it and shift everything this way. If you don't have um, enough space for this you know little section in here, 12 inches, you could shrink this down to only be 24 inches and have your dishwasher um, as the only thing in this section. If you don't have room for a full 48 inch wide sink area, then you can just shrink this down to whatever size you need it to be. And all of a sudden, what looks like a huge kitchen area can be still functional, still have the same overall shape, but you could sh easily shave off three or four feet from, from the length of this wall, which I think is really cool because then it allows you to still use the same shape in a much smaller kitchen, right? And your island can go down. Again, this is nine and a half feet. It could easily be down to just four or five feet and still have the same amount of functionality. So that's the really great thing. Now, if you wanna ramp up with your space, then here are some options for having some more um, pantry space because I know that that's really hot right now and people like to have walk-in pantries. So here is what I would do if you've got space on this side. Okay, if you've got space for a walk-in pantry, then this is the place I would put it. Um, I would I would make sure you've got enough space here to have an ample opening. So right now this is, what is this, two foot seven, two foot six. Um, so just, just about um, 30 inches of space, which is fine because you don't need to be cramming multiple people in here. This is not a thoroughfare. This is generally a one person walking through area at a time. So this is where I like to put it. You get rid of this cabinet. Okay, and then you integrate this new cabinet here. So this, your countertop all of a sudden runs all the way through to this back wall. So what I like to see here is a cabinet that sits on top of the countertop um, and goes full length from there, but it's a bit shallower so that you can still have a little bit of space here and you can see um, the light flowing through from this this one. So you can, you can just see past it, which I think is really nice. It offers a little bit of a barrier. Um, but it still offers a nice clean look. And this is where you can now put all of your tableware. So it's still gonna have a lot of functionality and a lot of space. Um, it's just now spun around the other way, which is really cool. Over here, I like to have more counter space if you've got the room for it. Um, and that way you keep another big window to light up this entire space, which I think is really great. And then here, a wall of more built-ins. So if you like to have, if you're a person who does not want to have one of these standard ranges with the oven under here, and you really have your heart set on um, built-in wall ovens, then this is the place to put it because this is this could be another bank of built-in pantry full depth if you want it. And you can put your wall ovens in here. Um, you can do a combination of some countertop because whenever you have wall ovens, you need a drop zone. So you need somewhere to be able to take something out of the oven, put it down on a countertop, um, check for doneness, close the oven door, whatever you need to do. Uh, so you need some counter space, a drop zone somewhere. So it could be further along here. It could be here if you want to put your oven here. Uh, I think that's really important. And then really you can make up your mind what this is. If it's full, if it's all full closed cabinetry, if you want this to be more open, you know, you've got a lot of space in here. I've left visually. Um, this is three and a half feet. So you could do 
you know, a little shallow bank of cabinets over here. You could do more on this side. It's really kind of whatever whatever you want to do. But having this space in this way means that it's visually blocked off from people. They could kind of see in and see the light without seeing all of your clutter, which is going to be behind this wall, which is the great thing that I think people are really looking for when they want a walk-in pantry. They want to be able to hide more of their appliances um, and, and put it out of the way. So this really keeps visually it out of the way, but you don't have to close the door. You could, you could make this a pocket door if you wanted to, you could shrink the size of this cabinet and you could make this a pocket door that actually fits right around the shape of the, um, the lower cabinets and the countertop. And you could actually have a door that goes all the way to the end if you really wanted to cover it off. But I really like the openness of it. I actually like the fact that it makes the kitchen feel so much bigger um, with much more light coming through. So this is this is really what I would recommend if you have extra space for a walk-in pantry. Otherwise, if you don't have space for a walk-in pantry but you want other cabinets, you can use perhaps other walls. So maybe having uh, more cabinets on this side or having your lower cabinets over here extend this way into another room. That's two other ways where you can have more cabinetry, more storage that's still in the general area of the kitchen without being a walk-in pantry, right? You can easily put your vacuum in here and your brooms and your your extra toilet paper and paper towel from Costco and your cans and whatever else you need that to store that you don't necessarily need to access all the time other cabinets somewhere else finding some other storage out of the way is a great way to find other space without having to have it in your triangle because that really is what it always comes down to right is the functionality of this triangle the prep space right here keeping other people out of your space and, and having the space to work, All right? And that's why we always have the sink and the fridge on the outer edges of the triangle. You always wanna have your range in the middle because this is the last thing that people need. But when they're coming over here for a drink and they're coming over to get something from the fridge, they're not in your workspace here. When they're coming to get a drink of water over here, they're not in your workspace over here. They kind of nip in the sides without having to bother you right in this this cooking zone, right? Because that's what we want to protect them from is the hot cooking slashes. We don't want people running past while we've got boiling water on the stove. That's what you want to protect them from. So that's really why this layout works so well. Now, one thing I wanted to note with the pantry over here is make sure you don't in sort of make this a multi-purpose space. If you've got space for a pantry, don't also make it uh, an entrance to your mud room or a powder room or something else like that. You never want to have this be a main thoroughfare. This is your triangle and it has to be protected. This pantry is just for you or whoever's doing direct contributions to the cooking at a given time. You never want to have access from the rest of your house, other areas, your garage, your bedrooms come through your kitchen triangle here. This is absolutely critical and I see this mistake so much. I'm going to make another post about it. Um, this has to be protected. This has to remain like this. Otherwise, it, it's going to ruin your triangle if you have traffic coming right through it. So that's really important. If you do need to share your pantry with a mudroom or other things, then make the entrance come around here right? And you can just, if you need to walk around, you just come around this wall and you need to get access that way. That's that's just how it has to be because you do not want to have main traffic coming through this part of your kitchen while you're trying to cook in there. So that's really critical. So there you have it. The greatest kitchen layout of all time. You think it's pretty great too, don't you? Let me know what you think. I would love to hear some comments from you. So you can always email me, karen at barncatreno.com or add some notes in the comments if you are on YouTube. Thanks so much for watching. Don't forget to go to my website and grab the two downloadable files so that you can implement this greatest of all time kitchen layout in your own home.